Before anything else, I'd like to let everyone know that Michael D. Cohn is not the lawyer of our guest speaker. I think so. I'm Bernard Kirsch, president of the Society of the Segovians, and I'd like to welcome this afternoon's speaker. And despite how many times my iPad spell checker keeps correcting me, we will not be listening to the Horowitz Report. <laughs> it is the Borowitz Report with a cat B, and he is Andy Borowitz, New Yorker writer, TV writer, book author, comedian, satirist, actor, creator of the TV sitcom, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Again, he is Andy Borowitz, not Sandy Horowitz. San Sandy Horowitz was my classmate in Hebrew school in the Bronx. <laughs> and Andy comes from Shaker Heights. I'm so happy Andy is with us today so that, as Andy says on his Facebook page, we can find out how we can make America not embarrassing again. <laughs> Andy also says, there is a fine line between social networking and wasting your fucking life. <laughs> Andy also says, getting the news from Twitter is like asking a cat for directions. <laughs> and finally, the hardest thing about life is that every now and then you have to do things so you have something to tweet about. It's Solorians. What, what is a Solorian, anyway? No one knows? It sounds like an inedible fruit of some sort. It just sounds terrible. All right. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I want to thank Bernie Kirsch for that amazing introduction. If I had known you were going to be that funny, I would have insisted that I not follow you because that is. But you were up. You were like a tumbler, like at at Grossinger's or something. I wish they would just rebuild Grossinger's so they could just put you and greet people. Right, that was very very funny. But then I noticed that Bernie was just killing with all this material, and then I realized all the material he was killing with were my jokes. He was like, so it's like. And I was not getting paid, you know, so he was using my material. He was like Huffington Post. He was just like, <laughs> he is an aggregator. Bernie, Bernie is what's wrong with journalism today. <laughs> Absolutely bringing our prices down to nothing. Shame on you. Anyway, it is, it is great to be here. And uh, uh, I guess some people are familiar uh, with what I do. But if you're not familiar with the Borowitz Report, uh, basically, every day, uh, I make shit up. That's what I do. It's kind of like, uh, how do I describe it? Are you familiar with Sarah Huckabee Sanders? Um, it's in that genre. It's the same, same genre. Uh, now, I'm just going gonna, gonna to talk for a few minutes, um, and then I want to take your questions. So I uh, understand there are a lot of questions here, and there are a lot of inquisitive. There are reporter types, and reporters do have questions. Um, but I wanted to just, uh, this is a question that's going to come up, so I just wanted to address it, which is a lot of people will ask me, they'll say, you're writing fake news. How do you even do that in this era where our reality is so insane, and you can't possibly improve upon anything that is already happening, and it is a, it is a problem. Um, because basically, you know, the job of a satirist is to try to come up with these scenarios that are kind of elevated from reality and a little bit exaggerated. And I can come up with the craziest thing in the world, and with an hour, um, <laughs> Donald Trump will do that exact same thing. And so it's like, I'm not even, I don't even think my news is fake, it's just early, you know? <laughs> at best, at best. That is the best case scenario is I beat him by like half an hour. And I mean, there are many cases of that where I did, I did a story, um, I did a story about a year ago and uh, the headline was, um, Trump says he's been treated very unfairly by people who wrote Constitution. And, um, <laughs> 
And it was just like, he was just saying in the story, he was like saying, the people who wrote the Constitution, they are very bad. Russia has a better Constitution than we have. When I found out who they are, I'm going to get rid of those people. They're terrible writers. We have better Constitution writers. So he was doing this whole thing. And then literally the next day, he was doing an interview with somebody saying, and he was really saying, like, since I've got here, I realize there are these other branches of government. It's terrible. <laughs> and he was basically just saying what I said. So it's, it's made me realize that my job has changed so much since Trump's been elected, because now I'm really kind of just doing straight reporting. I'm not, <laughs> it would be the dumbest thing in the world for me to try to come up with things that are crazy or insane or ridiculous, because, I mean, if we had, you know, we had elected somebody like Mitt Romney, you know, who I gave so, such a hard time to when he was running for president, now he seems like Mandela. Um, <laughs> but, But you know, the ideal thing for a satirist is to, is to have somebody like Mitt Romney who's like the perfect foil because he's so straight and he's kind of, you can, you can put him into a ridiculous scenario and it becomes funny, but when you already have this guy who is, you know, a former game show host, you know, it's just who is now our president, there's no way that you can improve on that. It's created another problem, and this is an pro institutional problem for The New Yorker, which, which publishes the Borowitz Support, is that when I first started writing the Borowitz Report in 2012, which was still the Obama era, it was a little bit strange because you had the New Yorker, which is this institution that's famously devoted to fact-checking, uh, to an extreme, to, to the extent that they even, and I'm not making this up, they even fact-checked the cartoons. This is true. <laughs> so like, if you, you know, do like a, a cartoon of like the Statue of Liberty, and there's something slightly different about the way her, you know, toga is draping. They will like fact check that and you have to change that. I'm not, that is not a joke. They've always been very, very serious about this stuff. And I would, when I was doing Shouts and Murmurs, I would have like, um, uh, you know, a character say something like, Jesus Christ, and they would call me up and say, now you're referring to the religious leader, Jesus Christ, and I'd say yes, yes, and then the fact checker would go on to the next thing. So they've always been very obsessed with fact checking and I thought it was a little strange that somebody who makes all of his facts up would be publishing alongside all this great journalism, but they labeled it satire and they tried to make it very clear. Since Trump, the fact that my pieces are very clearly labeled satire has made no difference to the reader. Um, in that we now have a massive reading comprehension problem where people read my stories and basically think they're true because it's really impossible in many cases to tell the difference. I, um, I brought a few examples of this. I brought a few examples of recent sort of post-Trump stories uh, that were widely mistaken to be uh, real stories. And since you're you know, real journalists, I thought that you might be better, you know, you could probably suss out whether there are any details in any of these stories that would be like maybe telltale signs uh, that they weren't true. Um, this is a story that, uh, and these sort of condensed versions to give you the idea, but this is a story that I published um, uh, right after Trump was elected, but before he was inaugurated, it was when he was putting together that amazing cabinet that he has um, right now. And the headline, this was widely believed to be true, the headline was, Trump picks El Chapo to run DEA. <laughs> <clears throat> Just days after picking Betsy DeVos to run the Department of Education, President-elect Donald Trump has tapped another wealthy outsider by naming Joaquin Guzman, known as El Chapo, to head the Drug Enforcement Administration. In an official statement, Trump said that El Chapo's, quote, tremendous success in the private sector showed that he has what it takes to shake things up at the DEA. Okay, so that was, that was you know, it had to be kind of debunked online so that we would know that uh, that wasn't true. This one, um, widely believed to be true. Um, this, this happened, just put in context, there was that period of time after Trump was elected where Trump became obsessed uh, with the fact that Barack Obama was eavesdropping on him somehow. And, and Kellyanne Conway actually went on CNN and said, well, everyone knows that a microwave oven can be used to eavesdrop on people. And I was like, yeah, everyone who's psychotic, I mean. <laughs> so, 
so this um, inspired, if that's the word for it, um, it it's inspired the story. The headline was, um, Trump orders all White House phones covered in tinfoil. <laughs> Here's just a little snippet from the story. Um, uh, the president, still wearing his bathrobe after what was reportedly a sleepless night, personally supervised the tinfoil installation, sources said. Wrap it tighter, he was heard bellowing at Kellyanne Conway. <laughs> after the installation was complete, Trump ordered the Secret Service to check every room in the White House for signs of former President Barack Obama. <laughs> He's still here somewhere, I know it, Trump reportedly muttered. Okay, now, again, as reporters, you might say, now that's kind of an insane story. Who on earth would believe that that story was true? The answer is the entire nation of China. Um, what I'm... <laughs> What I'm now going um, uh, to read to you is a story. This is not from the Borowitz Report. This is from the New York Times, which I guess there are some people here who probably work for the New York Times or have worked for the New York Times. It's also known as the failing New York Times, I believe. That's part of the brand. It's part of the brand. Uh, fake news. Fake news. Um, terrible. Um, uh, the, uh, they decided to write a story covering, um, actually about the Borowitz Report's coverage of the tinfoil story. And uh, I really, this is actually so much funnier than anything I've written. I'm just gonna quote it and get my laughs off of what the New York Times wrote. I'm sort of doing a Bernie Kirsch here. I'm just <laughs> reading someone else's stuff, but at least I'm, you know, I, no, I'm not paying them either, so I am exactly doing what you're doing. Um, okay, uh, the headline is, Chinese mistake satire on Trump for real news. The story dripped with intrigue. A frantic President Trump, holding court in a bathrobe, ordered his aides to wrap the White House telephones in tinfoil, several Chinese publications reported this week, <laughs> citing The New Yorker. <laughs> so good for our brand, right, isn't it? Fantastic. There was only one problem. The New Yorker article by the comedian Andy Borowitz was satire. That did not stop the story purporting to describe the depths of Mr. Trump's worry that his predecessor, former President Barack Obama, was eavesdropping on him from ricocheting across the Chinese internet. Trump turns White House upside down looking for signs of Obama. I know he's still here read headlines in respected Chinese publications. It was not the first time that an American humorist has unintentionally duped the Chinese news media. In 2013, Xinhua, the official news agency, mistook as fact a satirical report by Mr. Borowitz about the purchase of the Washington Post by Jeff Bezos, the Amazon chief executive. The Borowitz Report article said that Mr. Bezos had bought the newspaper by clicking on it by mistake. <laughs> well. Do we have any Washington Post uh, employees here today, by any chance? Yeah, we've got a few, okay. Well, again, um, you know, you, you can tell me whether or not this seems credible. I went back into the Borowitz Report archives and tried to see what that article um, you know, about Amazon was, just to see if this sounded like something that could be mistaken for a real news story. Here's a just quick excerpt from it. Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon.com, told reporters today that his reported purchase of the Washington Post was, quote, a gigantic mix-up, explaining that he had clicked on the newspaper by mistake. I guess I was just kind of browsing through their website and not paying close attention to what I was doing, he said. No way did I intend to buy anything. <laughs> Miss, Mr. Bezos said he had been oblivious to his online shopping error until earlier today when he saw an unusual charge. <laughs> for $250 million on his American Express statement. <laughs> okay. All right, you've been very patient. You've been very patient as I've been quoting my past material. Um, I'm just gonna, before I take some questions, I'm just gonna end with these. These are two headlines about some people who've been in the news uh, recently. 
um, that also had to be widely debunked. There's this, um, there's this website, great website uh, out there called Snopes.com, and Snopes, it's a little bit like politi PolitiFact, except that Snopes really specializes in debunking really, really insane conspiracy theories and things that no one would ever think uh, uh, were true. And they pretty much devoted an entire portion of their staff just to debunking my stories because <laughs> so many have turned up on Snopes.com. Here are two stories that, um, uh, two headlines uh, to stories that Snopes had to take a special, uh, you know, effort to uh, debunk because they were so cons considered so plausible. Uh, this headline uh, was, Jared Kushner calls Kim Jong-un totally unqualified person who got job only through nepotism. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing I, I loved about this, writing this story was I would go on Facebook to see the comments on this story and there were people who would invariably say things like, well, isn't that the pot calling the kettle black? <laughs> And I was like, you nailed it. You nailed it. You saw the irony in his statement right away. There was no pulling one over you. Um, and this one also, this was a big feature on, on Snopes. And this has become kind of a, a trope that a lot of people do believe this is true. It's about Betsy DeVos once again. The headline was, DeVos says Trump's 40% approval rating means more than half of country supports him. So <laughs> that's it. That's all I got. Um, so there we go. So anyway, at this, at this point, I, I've given you sort of a, a trip down memory lane. But um, I'm open to any questions about, you know, not just about politics and current events, but all right. Oh, OK. Oh, I thought he was going to say something into it. I didn't realize he was performing a valuable service here. Thank you. So what's been spiked? What haven't they let you get away with? Oh, the question what is... What has been spiked? What has been spiked? I love it when we talk journalism talk as if I were a journalist. It's so good. <laughs> what's been spiked? What was your lead like? Um, um, so what's been spiked? Well, you know, it's the, the history of my column is that I actually started... Doing, my, doing this independently. It didn't, a lot of people just found out about it when I went to The New Yorker, but I actually started it in 2001 just on my own. I created my own website called Borowitz Report, borowitzreport.com. And I, I was, so I was, had a lot of, shall we say, editorial freedom in that arrangement. Also, um, I wasn't getting paid anything, but um, I was writing other things for The New Yorker. I was writing Shouts and Murmurs and Talk of the Town and things like that. So I had a relationship with them. And in about 2010 um, or so, David Remnick came to me and he said, would you consider like writing the Borowitz Report for The New Yorker? And, um, and I said, well, what, you know, what kind of offer could you make for me to do that? And he, uh, the, uh, the initial offer he made, um, I considered too low because it was for zero dollars. Um, <laughs> which he was a shrewd negotiator. He came in low, um, came in very low. And, um, but he was sort of arguing that, he was sort of arguing that uh, I, you know, I, you know, I would get, it would be good exposure, it would be good for my brand, all that stuff that, you know, that you, maybe some of you have heard people tell you over the, over the years. Um, and I was, you know, I, I love David and I love The New Yorker and I very politely um, declined. But a couple of years later, they were really starting to ramp up their website because the website initially, The New Yorker was very late to the whole digital game. And they, their website was basically a Condé Nast website that just allowed you to subscribe and didn't really have much content in it. And in 2012, they, um, they hired, well, a little bit before then, they hired this very smart guy, Nick Thompson, who's now the editor of Wired. And Nick really understood the internet. And, you know, they, you know, David and Nick and Susan Morrison, who is my editor on the magazine side, took me out to lunch. And, and David said, you know, I, I really feel like a couple of years ago when I approached you about doing the Borowitz Report, I really feel like I kind of screwed up that deal. <laughs> and uh, with, with uh, I guess, a... a, 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 a an offer that was too modest, perhaps. It was a little on the, <laughs> little on the meager side. Um, so at, at that point, um, he actually 
offered to pay me to do it, um, which, you know, is just a thing I have. I like getting paid <laughs> to work. It's a really weird, it's a weird, very persnickety thing that I've got. And so, um, so then, you know, then began the process of, of suddenly getting paid, but also having an editor and having to, you know, listen to their input. And on the whole, I would say it was, it's, you know, out of, I mean, I write maybe 120 stories a year, like about every three days I write a story. So if you do the math, we won't have Betsy DeVos do the math, but I will do the math. It's been almost six years, so that's, that's like about 700 stories, I guess. So out of those 700, I would say fewer than 10 have been spiked. So that's, um, so I'm, I'm really, they play ball with me, but also the other thing is that, and you know this from writing for, for real publications, that like, you also get a sense of what will get published. I mean, there are things, I know that I can't use terrible language the way, The Onion can get away with like using, you know, terrible language in their headlines. We would never do that. The New Yorker, like the ghost of Mr. Sean would come up and, and, and strangle me. So we, we there, but in a way that's good because having limits on what I can do and it's not so much, it, it, I guess you could say in a sense it's self-censorship, but it's also just, it's nice to have some limits because then you find out how can I be funny or try to be funny within those limits and not always resort to just, you know, a penis joke or, you know, whatever. I use penis jokes, I would say, very, like once a month at most. Um, no, 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 I actually have not, have not done that. I have not. So what's been spiked? Well, here's an example, like right after the election, I don't know about you, I, I was actually very angry with the results of the election. Um, I don't want to drop a bomb on you like that, but I just, I, I was not in favor of, um, of the outcome of that election. So my, my few, first few stories out the gate, like the day after the election, were all very, very scathing, but they were very scathing about Trump supporters on the whole, because I just felt, um, you know, there was, there was all this talk after the election of, oh, like, and it, probably some of you saw this in the publications you work for, like the media got totally blindsided and the polls were wrong and the conventional wisdom was wrong and all the punditry was wrong and people went into this kind of defensive crouch of like, oh, we missed the story, like, let's try to understand these people. And it's like, I'm not a big believer in understanding idiots, I am not. <laughs> and I can say that because I don't have to be fair I don't have to be nice, and I don't have, I'm not a real journalist, so that's just my opinion. I think a lot of dumb people, you could not say it was a good idea to elect a former game show host with a glaring personality disorder and multiple bankruptcies. You not say, that's the guy who should have the nuclear codes right there, unless you were kind of dumb. That's not true of everybody who voted for him, but I thought it was true of maybe 58 million of the people who voted for him. <laughs> Just to, just to ballpark a number. And, you know, and I, and, and um, so my first few stories were, I can't remember what the headlines were, but they were very scathing about, about Trump supporters. And, um, and my editor, Nick, who I love and is now at Wired, Nick said to me, he said, look, we can't do these stories where you're just, you know, you know, you're just cutting on Trump supporters. And I said, well, why not? And he said, we don't want the New Yorker to seem elitist. <laughs> and, and I was like, you know, I think, I think once a magazine decides that its mascot is going to wear a top hat and a monocle, <laughs> I think the ship has kind of sailed on the whole. I mean, we're not exactly, you know, hillbilly elegy over here, you know, at Condé Nast. But it was, but it was interesting, and I think actually over time, I think I was kind of, I, I, I'm not, not going to say I was at the vanguard, but I think the coverage actually has moved more in that direction. Like, I think that uh, after the initial sort of convulsive shock of, of response, I think people are not as afraid to talk about how, like, they, they maybe are not as impolitic about it as I am, but they will more 
you know, they're more willing to say that, say, the Trump voters were sold a bill of goods. They're more willing to say that, which they wouldn't have been able to say the week after the, the election. So um, it was just more of an adjustment process. But, you know, in, in, in general, though, I would say that's like the most, you know, memorable example of when they spike something. But, you know, usually uh, it's not a problem. So um, I've, I've, been, I've been okay. Uh, yes, I've been relying on fake news to get this story. So, f and so far, I think they haven't. And since you're in the vanguard, you'll have to forgive me if you've already done this story. Where are you just but pitching I want, a story I, now? I, 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 can you like bring, open can mic you bring right us up the... to speed on what? Can you bring us up to speed on what you think the latest discussions are involving the Melania Trump prenup? <laughs> the. The Melania, so what the latest discussions are? Well, there wouldn't be latest discussions about a prenup because they're already married. So I'm just doing a little, I know that we don't have copy editors anymore in this industry, but I just have to copy edit, I have to copy edit your statement because you, the prenup, you now would be a postnup for them to be having discussions currently. So I want you to, to do a new draft of your question and get back to me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think it was a good start. It had your, your question had a lot of good stuff in it. I really liked it. I just, I a lot of good, there was so much good writing there and I liked it. I just feel like just one more time through the typewriter and that's gonna be an awesome question. And, and, then, I'll, and then I'll take another look at it and we'll go from there, okay? <laughs> great, thanks, thanks for that, it was great. Andy, I, w uh, I wanna next, go back to the beginning yes. of Andy Borowitz. When Mike did, is everywhere, by when the way. Did, <laughs> when did you decide you were funny? Um, oh gosh, that's why, first of all, I like the premise of that question because it assumes, it assumes I am funny. You know, it, you know, it's, you know, it's funny, I did a, a panel once with um, David Sedaris and David S Sedaris had a great comment which stayed with me because there's this cliche about comedy that there's nothing harder than, than comedy and that, and that, you know, there's that line like, I think it was in the movie My Favorite Year where the Peter O'Toole character is, is saying, you know, he, he was talking about acting and he was saying, dying is easy, comedy is hard, you know? And it's become a cliche that comedy is like this really, really hard thing to do. I think it's, I think um, David said it really well, which he said, comedy is really hard unless you're funny. And, <laughs> and I think that's like, I think either you have a point of view that, and by the way, I know that, I mean, there are probably people who think I'm terribly unfunny, like that's the nature of comedy too, is that everybody, it's so subjective and it it's all comes down to taste. There are people that, you know, other people think are funny that I don't think are funny and vice versa. So I, I tend to be very democratic about it and think like anything that makes people laugh is by definition funny to, to them. I mean, it's, it's, and that's, you know, as, as, as Sean Spice would say, period, like that's the end of it. But, um, I think in my, I think, you know, it goes back to your childhood and, and how you were raised. And um, I did not come from a funny family, but um, everybody else in my family was a lawyer. And uh, I'm not saying that a family of lawyers can't be funny, but it is against the odds that that's gonna happen. <laughs> but um, my, parents, my parents were both, um, very, very smart, well-educated people. They met at Harvard. They were both undergraduates at Harvard. And I say that um, even at the risk of, of making you hate them because, um, you know, I, I, I went to Harvard and I can tell you, I think it is the most alienating thing you can say to anybody uh, that someone went to Harvard. I really, I, th I do think that's true. I, I'll give you, let me give you an example. If I said that I, um, Okay, let's say I said that I cooked meth. Um, some of you would probably say, well, we ought to be understanding. You know, we don't know what led him to cook meth. Let's show some compassion here. But if I said that I went to Harvard, you'd be like, what a dick, you know? <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm putting it out there. They both, they both went to Harvard and they were both, um, you know, Phi Beta Kappa, and, and so it was challenging growing up in a family like that. And um, I remember vividly there was one, um, one dinner conversation where we were at our, our dinner, and 
I was like, I was in middle school and I was guess, I guess I was looking a little bit down in the mouth. And my father, um, showing a rare moment of interest in my well-being, <laughs> yeah. said to me, um, what's wrong? And I said, uh, the kids at school are continuously telling me I'm queer. Now, in my middle school in the 70s, what queer, queer didn't have a gay connotation so much as it meant you were uncool, you know, unpopular, not well-liked. And my father took this in and he said to me, they're not continuously telling you you're queer. <laughs> They're continually. <laughs> telling you you're queer. Continuously would be. You're queer, you're queer, you're queer, you're queer, you're queer. <laughs> Continually would be, you're queer, you're queer, you're queer. So the moral of that story is that is why I'm severely damaged. <laughs> but I, I, I think it actually illustrates, you know, it, it does illustrate, like you, you can't, if you grow up feeling like you're you're really like killing it and you're like just, you know, you're, you're captain of the football team and like you're the one of the cool kids and all that. You, you won't have to rely on comedy so much. Your mind won't go, won't go to that. So I think it, maybe it's a little bit of a cliche, but I think, you know, to the extent that you feel like an outsider or not taken seriously to begin with, that kind of does shape your worldview. So I, I, I don't know that if there was a moment when I suddenly felt like, oh, I'm a funny, I think like when you start getting laughs, as a little kid, I was the baby in my family, and I think babies tend to be the, 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 the youngest kids in the family. They're not, they're not really taken seriously anyway. There's not, there, aren't, there aren't many hopes for their future. They're kind of <laughs> like the afterthought. And so you just have to start doing stuff to try to get attention. I think for me it was like getting laughs, and, and uh, sadly I'm still doing that, even, even at this point. Well, if it makes you feel any better, there are 124 people in this room who think you're funny. All right. That makes me feel momentarily better. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Hi. Could you name some people that you don't think are funny? That I, uh, some people who I don't... think are not funny? That I, who I, Mike Pence, I don't think is funny. <laughs> um, he's number one. Some people that we might assume are funny that you No, don't, no, yeah. no. I, you know, I, I won't do that because, again, um, if there's anybody, I, I really am, I'm not a comedy snob. I feel like if there's anybody who is, is honestly getting a laugh on a consistent basis, like, you know, there are comedians who maybe I would go to, if I went to like a, I don't go to a lot of comedy shows, but if I went to like, you know, an open mic night or something, or went to the comedy cellar and people were doing their stuff, there might be, I might see somebody and it wouldn't do anything for me, but other people would be like holding their sides with laughter. That person is by definition funny. I just don't. I, I just, I'm a big believer in, in, in stating opinions. Like, that person is funny to other people, maybe not funny to me, but I don't, I'm not, um, I'm not going to talk smack about any, any. Over here, kind of, Andy. Yes, over here. Hi, how do you draw the line between anger and humor? How do you draw the line between anger and humor? Shut the fuck up! <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That got a laugh, so you see there is no line. There is no line. I think most, I mean, I think most, um, most comedy does have an, have an edge of hostility. You know, when I was, this is gonna sound, again, gonna really alienate everybody, but when I wrote my senior thesis, I wrote, I, I was really interested in um, the people who wrote co the co comedy playwrights of the restoration period in England in the 17th century. And all these guys were obsessed with theories of laughter and what made people laugh. They were really, they were kind of nerdy about it. And the one theory that a lot of them subscribed to was this theory that Thomas Hobbes had in his book Leviathan, which is he thought that all laughter was based, and it's really kind of a clever sort of physiological theory that he thought that all laughter was based on something he called sudden glory, which is when people have a sense of their superiority over something else, 
very suddenly, and it it's it doesn't apply to everything. But if you if you see like you know a, a lot of the things that we do laugh at um, do involve some sense of very kind of Darwinian um, superiority, and so there's a savagery to it. It's like there's a savagery to comedy. So when it gets to the point where you know somebody is like saying, "Oh, can you do a humorous?" commentary where you're poking fun at the things that we do at Thanksgiving. And it's like when it gets that watered down where we're like we're not, there's no, the, all the hostility has been removed from it, it tends to get less and less, I'm not going to say not funny, but there's less and less um, laughter, <laughs> I guess is the thing. So I mean, I do think that like, you know, it's the real, the, you know, when you see really a really great comedian like Chris Rock, there's such an attack to everything he says, not just the words and not just the ideas, but the very, the delivery and his whole demeanor. It's an attack, and that's um, you know, and that that you know, there are other people who are really really funny who don't have that persona, like somebody like Bob Newhart, who seems like the least angry person in the world when you see his coming. But he's so scathing. I mean, he he takes on these kind of Midwestern uh, organization man characters. I'm thinking about all of his classic stuff from the 50s and 60s, and. It's just, it's scathing in a very understated way, but it's still very hostile. <laughs> so, um, you know, people, I am not a tortured, unhappy comedian. I tend to be a happy person. But I think one of the reasons is that I'm offloading so much anger and hostility <laughs> and getting paid to do so. So it's actually pretty healthy for me. And I think that to the extent that people like what I do, and as I said, not everybody does, but to the extent that people do, I think there's something cathartic about, um, you know, being able to sort of, uh, you know, vicariously express that anger. And people are very angry right now and feel also very powerless right now. And so there's something about satire that takes on targets that are big and that we and feel we feel very powerless to do anything about it. Just to be able to vent our anger at them is a healthy thing. And it's also, I feel, just physiologically makes us happier. It makes us more able to do things, for example, uh, if you're interested in political resistance, it's much easier to be a political activist if you're actually enraged and you're you're energized, and if you're just depressed and in a state of despond, there, you can't really get out of bed. So, um, so yeah, I think there's no line. I think most truly funny things are also really angry, but that's a really good question. Thanks. Following along on that, yes. <clears throat> what are you going to do if Donald Trump and his tribe? really are removed from office and all go down to Mar-a-Lago and sink in a sand trap? Well, I'm going to get fucking drunk and dance naked for a week is what I'm going to do. <laughs> and honestly, you know, people say like, what do you do? What, 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 where is your material going to come from? And, you know, Will Rogers had a great line. Now I'm going to quote Will Rogers for free, Bernie, so two can, two can play this game. Um, but Will, Will Rogers, who was like the great, you know, the, the most brilliant political comedian of his time, said, he said, there's no trick to being a humorist when you have the whole government working for you. And, <laughs> and, and the fact is, like, nothing changes. I mean, and, and Trump, I also like, I feel like even though I'm writing about Trump all the time because he's the guy, Trump's a symptom. I mean, Trump is a symptom of are the lowering of the bar of our society, not just our leaders, but like who we put on, you know, you know, the reality show thing was like a dangerous, that was sort of like the, you know, the canary in the coal mine or like the leading indicator as Myron Kandel would say. Um, did I get that right? Leading indicator? Trump's like a lagging indicator. It's like, Trump is like, um, you know, and I think Trump, I, you know, people, I hope you don't get take this the wrong way, Trump is in a way a good thing because Trump to me, and maybe I'm an optimist, to me it's like when addiction experts say you've hit bottom because that's like a chance for you to like recover, right? I mean, if you, um, uh, I have a friend who is a really great therapist. She does like, you know, she does alcohol and cocaine addiction um, therapy and, and you know, she, she talks about this process and she said, you know, um, you know, basically, if you drink too much and you wake up and you have a hangover, you know, you might take some Tylenol and by the end of the day you might feel better enough that you might feel like, okay, I'm going to have another drink and then you just go on and on like that. But if you wake up in the morning and you're in the gutter 
and you've shat yourself, and a, and a dog is humping you, um, then you might decide it's time to rethink some of my decisions. And the United States of America is being humped every day right now. That's where we are. And people, if you look at some of these election results, you see like, okay, people are maybe starting to say, uh, you know, okay, maybe we really have to start thinking about what has led us to this direction. So I, I feel like we, you know, this will end at some point, hopefully not like with a big mushroom cloud. Um, that is a hilarious joke, by the way. Um, could never happen. Um, but, uh, you know, at, we're still gonna have lots of, um, you know, stupidity and hypocrisy and all those things that Will Rogers wrote about. The question for me is just like, I do not, honestly, if Trump, by whatever, you know, you know, whether it's, you know, because Stormy's got the goods on him and, you know, Michael Cohen is like, you know, just a one-man wrecking crew. of so any of those sort of Mueller-based options I'm completely down with, um, I think those would be great. Um, I, if he, I mean, I thought it was a little bit lame when, when Jim Comey said the other day, well, I don't think he should be impeached. I think that would be letting the American people off the hook. And it's like saying, dude, you're the reason he's here. <laughs> like, the American people were all ready to vote for the other person, and then you, you fucked things up. So just fuck you, Jim Comey. That's my blurb for his book. Uh, it didn't wind up. But um, Jim Comey is a guy that everybody, I feel, can hate <laughs> equally. Um, but, uh, but no, I mean, what, whatever it takes to get him out of office, if the next day David Remnick called me up and said, your services are no longer required, I'd be like, Fair enough. <laughs> I'd just be so happy to have our democracy back, it would not matter. And I mean that 100% seriously. So, there you go. Um, you have him? Yes, yes. I'm taking us down memory lane, since we are Silurians, to humor when we were growing up, which was a man walks into a bar, <laughs> or something of along a narrative line, with a punchline, and everyone thought it was uproarious. Mm -hmm. That doesn't exist anymore. I'm curious if it ever was something you grew up with or that in any way affected you, and why you think it doesn't exist anymore. Are you talking about sort of the, um, are you sort of, are you talking about sort of like the idea of like a joke joke, where it's yes. like a little story? Yes, it's a narrative. A narrative With joke. A punchline. I'm, I'm not so sure that that's totally gone away. Don't you sometimes hear jokes like that every now and then? I think people are still. I'm not so. I'm not sure I agree with the premise of your. Um, I mean, I think that. I mean, I think what's interesting when you go like read Mark Twain, for example, like there. I think somebody has a Twitter feed, that's just Mark Twain lines, and it's amazing to me how, like, what's really, really. I mean, he's such a brilliant writer, and what's really funny in his writing was expressed so plainly that it hasn't really dated. I sort of, I'm kind of a big believer that there's nothing really new under the sun. Like, I think that um, certainly there are some things like YouTube videos, okay, that's a whole new genre, and that's not, maybe that's a generational thing, maybe not everybody finds those equally funny, so that's like a new thing. But I feel, I feel like we're, with the internet now, we're in a very sort of, we, we have this kind of, big tent where I feel like all kinds of like, you know, somebody like Bob Newhart or, or you know, going back ways, Will Rogers or Mark Twain or Chris Rock all kind of coexist in this kind of amazing library that you can just summon up at any moment. I mean, there's, there are certain things, um, you know, I mean, there's, there are certain things on the internet like, you know, Mitt Romney trying to be hip you know, and saying, who let the dogs out? I mean, when, when I'm in a bad mood, I just like summon that up again and I'm, I'm right back and my serotonin level rises right away. So, I don't know, I think it's still there. I think, I think, you know, jokes on Twitter probably have a different flavor because they're not, you know, they're, everybody's trying to out clever each other and so they wouldn't do something that's that kind of, you know, old school, but you know, Old school is still funny. I mean, Mark Twain is still funny. And, uh, you know, Thomas Hobbes, hilarious. <laughs> so, um, Andy, Andy, all the way over here. All the way over here, okay. Um, thanks, Andy. Listen, this, 
unabashed levity in this room is a little disturbing. I mean, given the state of the country and who's running it and all that, and my ser very serious question to you is, do you think that we can laugh Trump out of office? Well, that's a, first of all, that's a good question. The, I mean, uh, you know, I have mixed feelings about comedy right now because I feel like I don't want comedy to be purely palliative. Like, I feel that there are a lot of people who say, like, um, I mean, it's very nice. People will say, you know, they love, you know, th they'll come up to me on the street and say, oh, you're, like, helping keep me sane and everything. And, and I love that. I love that side of, like, as an entertainer, you want to make people laugh and you want to make people happy. But I don't want people to be so happy that they're like, okay, everything's all right. You know, everything's okay because I feel better now um, because you made me help, help me. So I, I will often say, and this is probably a jerky response, but I will often say, I'll thank them and say, thanks so much. It means a lot to me because I'm, I'm glad that I helped make you sane. Now my question to you is, what are you going to do with that sanity? Now that I've made you sane, and by the way, getting sanity from me is a very dubious provenance. <laughs> But I'm not questioning that. With this so-called sanity that I've given you, like, you know, fire to Prometheus, um, will you, like, help register someone to vote? Will you canvass for a candidate? Will you, you know, march on Washington? I mean it seriously. It's a serious question, and I mean it. If I, I, I feel like when we just make fun of what a buffoon Trump is, that makes me nervous. Because then I feel like we're doing Trump a favor. Um, so, like, I'm not 100% interested in turning Trump into a, a burlesque figure. Burlesque is very different from satire, not to get too much like my senior thesis here, but if we're just sort of laughing like, oh, he's silly and he's harmless, then I think comedy is working for him. So, I always, like, people will sometimes say, they'll read my thing and say, like, your stuff has gotten so dark, like, you've just gotten... Like, you know, this is like funny, not funny, people will say. It's like you're, you're, you're talking about how, how the Russians have taken over and blah, blah, blah. And I do that part mainly because that's what I feel like, that's how I express myself now. That's my genuine response to what's going on in the country. But also I sort of feel like I want people to be awake and I want them to be aware and I don't want them just to think, oh, Trump's like a funny guy with like little hands. Like if, it, if, it just, if it's just about that, then I think comedy is working for him. It's, comedy then becomes very reactionary and very much, I think, I think Trump can live with him being made fun of, um, you know, I mean, it probably annoys him personally, but who cares? Like the goal isn't to really make him annoyed. The goal is to remove him from office. So um, I don't think, by the way, that I have I don't think that I have a huge amount of influence on whether Trump remains president. I think that at very best, I can maybe motivate a few people who are otherwise too depressed to do anything, to do a little small thing to help that. I, don't, I, I, I get nervous when I hear comedians act like they're these messianic figures who are gonna somehow, um, you know, that we alone are going to make, change, change the laws of the land. That's so ridiculous and it's so grandiose. I just feel like, in a tiny, tiny way, if I can get some individuals to, to take action, that's at least a tiny contribution. So, thanks. Yes. Hi. In the, in the age of social media, I can't tell you how many times your reports come out, you know, your uh, articles come out, and then I have to debate some crazy family members <laughs> because they can't tell between truth, fiction, or comedy. Mm -hmm. Like the bone spurs, somebody called treasonous in my family. So I guess my question is... That, that what you're referring to is a story I, I had about how the Pentagon said that the military would not yeah. participate in Trump's parade because they were all citing bone, bone spurs. spurs. And <laughs> there was a sudden epidemic of bone spur ailments. Because, because the way you write, people mistaken it for actual... Uh, right. News coverage. So right. the question is, how long have you been before people kind of woke up and said, well, he's just being funny. He's a satir sat satirist. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it, as I said at the beginning, you know, we couldn't, after the election especially, we doubled down on labeling everything satire. It's like, says satire now, like every third word in my column. It's like, other than calling the column, just kidding, none of this is true, you fucking moron. Um, <laughs> Other than changing it to that, I don't, and probably then they would still say, look what the New Yorker just printed. <laughs> um, but uh, 
you know, um, there's this sort of, th you know, there's this kind of confirmation bias where like people bring so much to the table when they read something that it really does interfere with their their reading comprehension. So if you have like family members who are like real Trumpies and they are just, they immediately are embattled whenever anyone says anything bad about their president, they're going to overlook all these things, all these markers. We even have a logo now that says, um, a very clever slogan I came up with to kind of indicate that the, um, that it was satire, that Nick, my former editor said, what can we say on your story so that people will know that it's not the news? And I said, why don't we say not the news? <laughs> so now like on social media, there's this little banner on all my stories that say the Borowitz Report, and then it has a picture, a cartoon of me like laughing, and then it says not the news, and yet people just completely override that with their confirmation bias and say, how can the military be claiming they have bone spurs, you know? <laughs> so, um, but, um, did I answer the question or did I just ramble? What was, what was did you have a specific? Oh, well, some, some, some never will. So many will go to their grave still not knowing. Um, I mean, you know, but I will see, I'll see on Facebook a lot, people will share things of mine and they'll quickly, they'll say things like satire alert. I mean, people are constantly, because I think they've had that experience of people, people on their timeline, um, you know, not understanding, you know, on their feed, not understanding that it's, that it's made up. And the only thing I want to say is like, um, if I've caused any kind of stress between you and the Trump members of your family, um, I'm thrilled about that. So <laughs> I'm glad. That's what I mean by making a small contribution. If I can maybe cause some divorces, I don't know, just anything. It's the, it's the least I can do. Two more uh, quick questions. Two more quick questions. Okay. Why do you think so few daily newspapers invest in a humor column? Uh, for instance, we have a guy out on Long Island, Jerry Zezima, who has written three collections of humor essays, and he's been president of a national group of columnists. But his work runs in the Stanford Advocate in Connecticut, and Newsday rarely, if ever, will show a funny bone and run it. You know, that's a really good question, and I, I, I'm friends with um, the guy who is probably more successful at that than anybody, Dave Barry. And Dave, you know, retired about, you know, he still writes, but he doesn't do the, the grind, I think, got a little bit too, too much. He did it for like 30 years. But, you know, it was funny, at around the time that he got out of it, which is around 2004, um, a bunch of like syndicators approached me and said, you know, what if we, this was before I went to the New Yorker, and they said, what if you, we did the Borowitz Report as a syndicated column? And you know, what I found was, and this is probably sort of a larger comment on the newspaper industry, was that the op-ed space of all these newspapers has really shrunk. I mean, they, um, in, in general, op-ed and editorial page editors um, were, undergoing the same problems that every other section of the newspapers were going through, which is papers getting smaller, um, fewer ads, fewer column inches. And so like the notion of if they could take, for example, a very famous syndicated column that they were already getting as part of their deal with one of the syndicators, then somebody like the guy that you're referring to doesn't have a chance because he's already, they've already got something and they're already running this and they're running something from, you know, the AP and the Times and all that. So I think it's more a comment on the newspaper industry. Let's end on something less depressing than that. <laughs> that was like the last, the last thing I wanted to leave people with. Last I, question. I, Make this one just unbelievably great. So <laughs> we can, I just send us off flying. I, I really do want to impress you because you impress me all the time. That is a great question. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no I'll, I, let, I'll let you. What, what, one of my early awarenesses of, of you and your humor was when you were on CNN in the morning quite mm -hmm. a number of years ago. Right. And, and while you were talking about your career at the New Yorker, et cetera, I'm wondering how that came about and, and why it ended. I instantaneously missed you when you disappeared from CNN. Well, um, you know, uh, I, 
it's funny, like, I, I, don't, I can't really explain how it started or how it ended. <laughs> and I sort of can't believe I did it. Like now, you know, now, nowadays actually, like on, I was doing sort of comedy in the mornings, which is, you know, not an on CNN. Um, I mean, there are very funny people on CNN, like Wolf Blitzer, but I mean, I, but <laughs> as you know, Myron knows what I'm talking about. Um, but, uh, you know, I think they were trying to inject some levity in the morning, like, you know, and, you know, I, so, you know, was, I did it for about three years, and there wasn't like, it was sort of like, I had done some appearances on, actually, Jeff Greenfield had a, sh a very short live show um, called, like, Greenfield at Large or something like that, and, and they brought me on a bunch of times, and I guess it went well, and so they said, well, you know, we really need to, to pay you to do this. That was like a, <laughs> that was like one of the only times someone ever voluntarily said that. But, um, <laughs> So, you know, I did it for a few years, like we were, I was doing like some news stuff and some pop culture stuff. It was really fun. It got me, I had to get up early in the morning, so I had to like shave and stuff. That was like a good, good habit and life skill to develop. Um, but, um, and then like, I think it was just sort of like they changed executive producers and changed formats. I was doing it when Soledad was on the show. And, and um, so there's actually no, there's no great story on either end of that. I mean, I will say that now, um, one thing that I have a little bit of a problem with, with all the cable news, not just, I mean, I'm leaving, I'm not even talking about Fox, because Fox, to me, Fox is in a different category. Fox is like, I put Fox in the same category as like the sci-fi channel. They're just a different, they're not doing news. No offense, how many, this is probably mainly a Fox crowd here today, is my <laughs> guess, so no offense. But, um, you, know, uh, you know, CNN, um, one, one thing that I have a problem with with CNN right now, and it's been a problem throughout, is that they have this kind of adherence to this kind of phony balance, and it's one of the reasons why we have Donald Trump, because, you know, the, during the election, they would, they would always try to do these false equivalencies between Trump and Hillary, and like, so Trump was assaulting 16 women, and then Hillary was using a private email <laughs> server, and these are somehow the same, uh, same thing. So, I, so like n nowadays, I wouldn't. I, the world of cable news, um, as a as a writer as a performer, doesn't appeal to me because I feel like it's kind of they do some good things. Like I like Jake Tapper. I think he's good. And they do some good things, but I think that it's sometimes part of the problem for that reason. And MSNBC. I know a lot of people love MSNBC, but to me, MSNBC is MSNBC is like. Um, it's like Fox for vegans. Um, it's just like people go and it's like, yeah, they, I, everything I think is just being confirmed for me in a very sarcastic way. And um, they also have, by the way, I think uh, one of the worst slogans of anything ever, which is their slogan for many years was um, lean forward, which is I, I think also the official slogan of the rectal exam. <laughs> I mean, I, like, what was their second choice, you know? It's like, you might feel some pressure, you know? Anyway. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you.